Hello, everybody, once again, and welcome to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. Great to have you with me once more as we take a look at Exodus 28, Proverbs 4, John 7, and Galatians 3. All right, let's jump right in here to these four chapters. First of all, Exodus chapter 28 is all about the clothing. And so not only did the uh, tabernacle itself have all of these uh, particular parts to it and all these instructions about what it should look like down to the colors, down to the materials that they were to make it from, but also the garments that the priests were to wear whether it's the high priest or it's just the other priests, what they had to wear, the sons of Aaron here to begin with, um, was very particular here. Again, very similar down to the colors of the yarns and down to the very materials. And so the, basically the two main points, parts here are the, uh, the ephah, this, this apron covering that they would wear, and then this chest piece that they would wear uh, over that in the front, in the middle here. And, uh, and and this chess piece had various jewels on it, and it was to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And so, what's going on here with the clothing? Why all of the detail about the clothing? Well, I think a couple things. One, uh, it goes to show the set-apart nature of the priest and the high priest in particular, right? This is uh, the the you know the uh, meaning of holiness here. God is holy. You don't just approach him willy-nilly. You don't just, you know, come to him at in any way here. He, his presence manifests in the uh, camp of Israel. And so he set apart, and, and as you have the, the outer tent, that's one level of, of separation between God and the people. Then you have the uh, the, the tabernacle itself, then you have the inner room inside the tabernacle. So you have all of these levels here uh, because God is holy and he's separate. And so when the priest, so only particular people can come before him and only at particular prescribed times and only in particularly prescribed ways. So that's what I think is the key here of what's going on is this separation between the people and God. And so this priest has to come and he has to come according to the specific instructions that are given. And, and he's also coming here as a representative of the people, right? It's the role. It's what the priest's role is. It's coming on behalf of the people. And so he's carrying, in essence, on his garment the you know all of the people's names all the tribes and so that as he's coming and doing the sacrifice or coming on the day of atonement whatever his role is that it's coming not just for himself but in as representative for all of the nation and so the clothes have to be exactly as God has prescribed and you can read all the details here in Exodus 28 all right then we turn over to Proverbs chapter 4 and again, still on this topic here, getting wisdom. Get It's wise to be wise. It's Getting wisdom is, is a wise thing to do. And most of this chapter is a description here of the paths of the evildoers and, and the uh, exhortation to not follow the paths of evildoers, how destructive it is. Right after he goes off at the begin here about how good it is to get wisdom, then he goes here and, and, and gives the warning. Don't do as the wicked do. Don't follow their paths. He says things like, um, evil people can't sleep until they've done their evil deed for the day. They can't rest till they cause someone to stumble. They eat the food of wickedness. They drink the wine of violence. And so there's this destructive nature of the wicked, but then contrasted to the way of the righteous, which is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. The way of the wicked is like total darkness, though. And so he says, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, guard your heart above all else. So, you know, there's, again, these two paths, and you have the way of the wicked here, and it's destructive, it's harmful. And you have the way of the righteous, which is good and life-giving. And so he says, don't follow the paths of evildoers. It leads to destruction. But rather, you have to guard your heart. Right? Because the reality is we don't see two paths as we go through our day. It's not as though, you know, before us, oh, there's this path on the left that leads to destruction and evil, and then this path on the right that leads to goodness and life. And so that's the, you know, why wisdom would say, okay, go down that path. But rather, this wisdom requires a lot of discernment. 
and it requires a lot of prayer, it requires a lot of trust in the Lord, because as he says, it's not like the, the evil path is full of, you know, all kinds of, you know, it's dangerous and dark and gloomy and there's all kinds of, you know, picture like bats and spiders and it's decrepit and everything. Oh, but look at this beautiful path over here. It's sunny and it's light. The spiritual reality is that's the case. One looks really bad and the other is really good. But when you actually are going through it, you have to guard your heart because there's an enticement actually to go with the evildoers. There's an enticement, temptation there to go down the foolish path. And so that's why there's so much of this exhorting and urging not to listen to the evildoers. Don't play with fire here. Don't go that direction. Guard your heart. Focus here on what's right and good, even though it might not look any different. It might not look like it's going to lead to life versus the other that's going to lead to death. But this is where trust in the Lord, right? Here's wisdom. So get it. Okay, so now I know. But I see it. And it's like, ah, I don't know because I see it and it looks enticing. But no, but I know. See, so that's where knowing wisdom comes in and trusting the Lord and believing what, okay, this is right and I believe that it's right and I believe that the end is good. So I'm going to do what the Lord says. All right, more to come on that. But first, John chapter 7. Uh, Jesus here, his brothers don't believe in him. It starts off with him and his brothers. They don't believe in him. They're going to Jerusalem for the festival. And so Jesus ends up going. He goes and he speaks openly about being from God. Well, you know, kind of the whole thing here in this chapter is Jesus in Jerusalem. And it's not nearly the end of his ministry. This isn't the end of his life trip to Jerusalem. This is an earlier trip to Jerusalem for the festival. And he's, he's there in Jerusalem and He's just in the temple courtyard. He's just out there preaching. He's saying, I'm from God. And uh, and nobody's doing anything. He even gets up and he says, you know, come and drink the living water that I offer you. Similar to what he had said several chapters ago in chapter 4 to the woman at the well. But now here he's in Jerusalem. He's standing up and he's saying, and he's saying come drink this this living water. And, um, and, and, and the... Uh, religious leaders, they won't do anything. They're not stopping him. And even the people are all like, why Why aren't they you know, stopping him? Why aren't they doing anything about him? But of course, it's, it's not yet his time. This is early in his ministry here. And again, he's preaching about the fact that he has come from God. He's making it very, very clear to the people who he is. You know, so, sometimes we look at Jesus' ministry and we think, oh, he's so cryptic. And, you know, he was t- going around, uh, you know, in... in, in uh, Galilee, far from Jerusalem, and he's telling people all these parables and everything. But here he is, he's in Jerusalem, standing up and, and preaching to the people, saying he's from God. And so it's very clear. And so what are they going to do? Are they going to listen or are they not going to listen? All right, so that's John 7. Then we go to Galatians chapter 3, lastly here. And Paul still talking about this uh, faith versus works. And he you know, poses this question to him at, you know, early in the chapter here. Did you receive the Holy Spirit because of works, right? How did you get saved? You know, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? How was your life changed? Was it because you did a bunch of good things? And I was like, oh, that's what led to it. And he says, or did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe in Christ by faith? And it was but just by faith. That, that's when they received the Holy Spirit. So the, the change, all the, the good works happened after the fact because of their their conversion, not leading up to their conversion. And so Paul goes on to describe here how rules and laws and the instruction that God gave through Moses actually led the people into sin. He says the law came to reveal sin. It increases an awareness of sin. And with that, therefore, comes a curse. And so if you want to put yourself under the law and say, okay, I'm going to live or die based on the law, then you're going to die. You're going to be under a curse because you're, the, the law is clear that you can't keep it. And it, so it makes it awareness of sin here. But then he says that Christ came and he became a curse by hanging on the tree in order to free us from the curse. And he argues this by saying that Abraham came before Moses, right? And how was Abraham saved? Could Abraham be saved by works of the law? Well, no, he lived before the law. Abraham is, was clear. He believed God and God credited to him as righteousness. And so he says, so Abraham came before Moses. And, and so that's how one is made right by faith. Well, then why the law? Well, again, the law, it reveals sin. It increases the awareness of need, awareness of need for a savior, awareness of one's own sin. 
So, uh, so Paul's building this argument to say, don't base your life, don't go down this path of thinking, I'm made right with God because of works of the law. He says, no, no, it was by faith. Just look at Abraham. Just look at your own testimony. It's by faith, not by works of the law. But of course, the law came so that the people would know, I, we need a Savior. We need a Savior. And, uh, and of course, this is Jesus. All right, Exodus 28, the clothing for the priest, Proverbs chapter 4, uh, getting wisdom, staying away from the path of evildoers, trusting the Lord, guarding your heart. John chapter 7, Jesus openly preaching in the temple. And Galatians chapter 3, and Paul talking about the uh, salvation by faith, not by works of the law, the law coming to, uh, to actually reveal sin and increase awareness of need. All right, that's all we have time for today. Hope you enjoyed your time in God's Word. Until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord and your nose in the book. We'll see you again soon.